someone once said that every Monday morning, 80% of pastors want to quit. I felt like that on many Monday mornings and maybe some Sunday afternoons as well. Um, and pastors feel that way because uh, we pour out our hearts into our work and something happens to bring discouragement um, and pastors just say it's not worth it. I've told you on a few occasions about one of my most discouraging moments in ministry. I was a brand new pastor. This was um, about 15 years ago. And one of our members, uh, his mother-in-law, was in the hospital dying of cancer. And he was concerned about her salvation. And so he asked me to visit her and, and um, perhaps share the gospel with her. And, and he was hoping that she would get saved. It was a big concern for him. She um, had about a week to live. So I eagerly agreed, and, and I went to the hospital, and I went in and introduced myself, and we started having a great conversation. And the conversation went on for about 20 minutes, and eventually the conversation led to her illness and the fact that she only had about a week to live, and I asked her about her eternity and if she knew where uh, she would be going and, and um, when she died, and she wasn't sure even though um, she had hope for heaven. And so I talked with her about how she could be sure and, and shared uh, about Christ and, and how he came as a substitute for our sins because we are all sinners and that we need to come to the point where we realize that um, he has come as our substitute and to ask Christ to forgive us and to realize that we're sinners and, and to ask for forgiveness of our sins. And so she stopped me at that point and she said to me, she, when I mentioned the word sin, and she said, sin? I'm not a sinner. She said, I may have lied once or twice, but I'm not a sinner. Now this was 15 years ago, as I said, and it still rings so clear in my head as if it was yesterday. And so I shared with her what scripture said about sin, but she, did, she wouldn't have it. She didn't want to hear anything about it. And so I switched to a different conversation and I stayed for a little while longer. And we started talking about other things like her family. Uh, she owned a restaurant in Worcester and we talked about that um, until eventually I left. Now that's not the discouraging part. People reject the gospel all the time. The discouraging part came the next day when um, her son-in-law reached out to me and, and he said, what went wrong yesterday? I said, nothing went wrong. And he went on to say that she accused me of, of coming in and bashing her about how bad she was and, and as some would say, beating her over the head with a Bible. Um, and she told her daughter and she told all the nurses that they should never let me back in, the, in her room. In fact, this is what she said because her son-in-law told me um, exactly this. But right as I left the room, she got the nurse and she said, you see that man that just left this room? Never let him back in this room. And her, I felt awful. I felt misunderstood. I was so discouraged. I felt wrongly accused. But the sad thing was, here was this woman who knew she was dying, she had brain cancer, but rather than deal with the eternal issue, she closed her heart and refused to see her spiritual condition. She died a week later. And unless something had changed in that week, she died and went to hell. Very sad. There have been many more discouraging moments in in ministry and there are many discouraging things in life for example it's discouraging thinking about the pandemic it's discouraging thinking about what's going on in Afghanistan and what breaks my heart above everything else is what's going on in Haiti it just breaks my heart and it's discouraging to think about but enough about me what about you you also get discouraged Maybe it's a situation at work that has discouraged you. Maybe you've been praying for 
a family member or a friend to get right with God and it's taking a long time and you're discouraged. Maybe you're serving in a ministry and things are not going the way that you had hoped it would go and it has got you discouraged. We all get discouraged. Now let's think about the word discourage, right? Let's, let's, it's the word courage with the D-I-S in front of it. And the D-I-S is a negative, and when you put it there, it means a lack of courage. I work a lot with college men, and sometimes I ask them the question, what is courage? And we always come to a definition of courage is the ability, ability to act despite fear. Despite having fear, you act anyways. And so discourage means that there's that lack of courage, that lack of ability to act. It's a lack of courage. But it goes deeper than that. And so the question is, how are we? How am I supposed to deal with those times when we get discouraged? Because we will all get discouraged at some point. And as we talk about discouragement, we find an example in the Bible with the prophet Elijah. Take your Bibles and turn to 1 Kings chapter 19. If you don't have a Bible, there's one in the seat in front of you. Um, 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings is in the Old Testament. <clears throat> if you need to use the table of contents, do that. Um, and, you know, many times we tend to stay away from the Old Testament. The Old Testament tends to be the cleanest part of our Bible in that it's not marked up as much, perhaps because people ha have a hard time understanding it, seeing it in its context, or maybe we don't feel it's relevant today. But Romans chapter 15 and verse 4 says, For whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction, so that through perseverance and the encouragement of the Scriptures we might have hope. The encouragement of the scriptures, it said, and it gives us hope. Now, the earlier times that are referred to in this verse here, he's talking about the Old Testament times. And so one of the best ways to be instructed, one of the best ways to develop perseverance, one of the best ways to be develop encouragement is to learn from the men and women in the Old Testament. And not only can we learn from their victories, but we can also learn from their defeat. So let's begin by reading our text this morning. You're in 1 Kings chapter 19. We're going to read verses 1 through 12. Let's read. Listen as I read. Now Ahab <clears throat> told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So may the gods do to me, and even more, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And he was afraid, and arose, and ran for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went on a day's journey, into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and he requested for himself that he might die and said it is enough now O lord take my life for i am not better than my father's he lay down and slept under a juniper tree and behold there was an angel touching him and he said to him arise eat then he looked, and behold, there was at his head a bread cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise, eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Oreb, the mountain of God. Then he came to a cave and lodged there, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? <clears throat> he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord and the God of hosts, for the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword, and I alone am left, and they seek my life to take it away. <clears throat> 
So he said, Go forth and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord was passing by, and a great and strong wind was rending the mountains and breaking it in pieces, the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a sound of a gentle blowing. Now, from what I read here, you could see the characters that are here in this chapter. We have Ahab, who is king over Israel. Uh, there's Jezebel, his wife, and she is a bad influence on uh, Ahab by pulling him away from the one true God to worship false gods, and especially the false god Baal. <clears throat> then we have Elijah. He was a prophet of God, and he was one of the most amazing men in Scripture. And he did some amazingly bold things. There was one occasion where he prayed earnestly and fervently that it would rain, and it rained. The week before that, he challenged King Ahab and the other false prophets to a showdown of calling down fire from heaven. But today we see him in a different light as he faces discouragement. He's lacking courage. And just like Elijah came out of nowhere, he just shows up on the pages of Scripture. Just like he came out of nowhere, this discouragement comes out of nowhere. But if we think about it and we look at his life, um, it, would, it was predictable. Elijah had just had one of the greatest spiritual victories um, that he could have, and so he should have known that discouragement might come. And that's typically what happens to Christians. It's usually uh, after spiritual victories that a time of discouragement will come, or, or at times where God is on the brink. He's about to do some great things that we can't see yet, but he's about to do some things and discouragement comes. The enemy wants to discourage us. That's his method. But 2 Corinthians 2.11 says, So that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan, for we're not ignorant of his schemes. That's how we are victorious if we're not ignorant of his schemes. We're not to be in the dark about how he operates. Discouragement is one of his biggest tools. There's an old fable about the day that Satan held an auction to try and raise money to do some of his work. And what he did was he went out and he got all the tools that he uses to wreak havoc and harm on men and women and children in this world. And he laid out all his tools on a table and, and he assigned a value to each of them and he started the auction. And he auctioned off tools like fear and anger and pride and hatred and envy and lust. And then someone noticed that there was one tool that wasn't on the table. It was, it was a, a, a old, well-worn tool that was, was off to the side, and it didn't have a price tag on it. And so they asked the devil, why isn't that tool for sale? Why isn't it on the table? Why isn't a value assigned to that particular tool? And he said, oh, I could never part with that tool. That's one of the most successful tools that I've ever used. I have used that tool for years to wreak havoc in the lives of people. I would never part with that tool. So they asked him, they said, what's the name of that tool? He said, the name of that tool is discouragement. Listen, when he uses that tool, he can make us feel like quitting. If he can discourage us, he can make us not care. And if he can discourage us, he can make us ineffective for God. If he can discourage us, he can lead us away from God and towards spiritual disaster. Someone said these words about discouragement. The measure of greatness in a man's life can be measured by what it takes to discourage him. Even the biblical leaders were discouraged. Think about it. Moses, after leading the people through the desert, he said, Lord, take my life. 
Jonah, after the huge repentance of Nineveh, they all repented. He said, Lord, kill me. Paul, when he was in Asia, he he despaired even of his life. But for Elijah to be discouraged is surprising. He never faced discouragement before. He was so bold. But lest we think that he's a super prophet, James reminds us that Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. He was flesh and blood, and he's prone to things that we're prone to. We can get discouraged. So it's not a matter of if, but it's when we will face discouragement. And if you're on a spiritual mountaintop, be aware because the enemy is going to try to discourage you. And if you're in the valley of discouragement right now, allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you because the enemy wants to keep you there. So, after that long introduction, if you're taking notes, I want you to know this first thing in your notes. The causes of discouragement. Look at verse 1 again in 1 Kings chapter 19. Now, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Now, this day started out with Elijah, I'm just giving you a little background, with Elijah and Obadiah out looking for water for their cattle. And as they're out walking, he meets up with King Ahab. And this is where Ahab calls Elijah. He says, who is this? Is this the troubler of Israel? He calls him the troubler of Israel. Then they, that happens, and then they have the showdown on, on Mount Carmel. And if you remember, uh, the prophets of Baal, you know, they, they, they challenge Elijah to say, who can call fire down from heaven? And the prophets of Baal, they're there and they're calling down fire and nothing happens. And Elijah is mocking them and he's like, perhaps Baal is off to the restroom. Maybe he's not hearing you. Shout a little louder. Maybe, you know, he's he's deaf and 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 he doesn't. And then then he says, all right, this is the time for the one true God to answer. And he builds up this bonfire area and he says, let's let's soak it with water. So they soak it with um, gallons and gallons of water. And they called on fire, and God sends fire from heaven and consumes not only the bonfire area, but also the prophets. So he meets up with Ahab. Ahab calls him the trouble of Israel. They have the showdown on Mount Carmel, where the true God answers by fire, and none of the false prophets uh, escape. Then Elijah, he after that, he prays. Remember, it hadn't rained for three years at that point, because Elijah had prayed that it wouldn't rain. But then he prayed that it would rain. And if you remember, he was there with his servant, and he's praying, he's crouched down, praying for rain, and he sends his servant to go look. Do you see any clouds? Servant comes back and says, there's no clouds. He prays again, he says, go back and look, nothing. Prays again, he says, go back and look. Servant comes back and says, there's a cloud about the size of a man's fist. And he says, perfect. Then it rains, it pours. And then that happens... And he outruns. Ahab is going to Jezreel on a chariot. And and Elijah pulls up his robe and he runs past Ahab and the chariot to Jezreel. He's on a spiritual high. And so Ahab is having a terrible day. Elijah is having a great day. And so verse 1, we see here that Ahab goes home and Jezebel asks, she says, how was your day, honey? And he has to recount all of this stuff that just happens. And when Jezebel hears this, she's furious. Look at verse 2. Then Jezebel sent a message to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and even more if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. Basically he's saying, may the gods kill me. She's saying this, may the gods kill me if I don't kill you by tomorrow. She hates him so much that she's willing to to put her life on the line. And after hearing this, Elijah is spooked. That spooked him. That's letter A, the first cause of discouragement. Discouragement is caused by fear. Look at his fear, verse 3. And he was afraid and arose 
and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. Now, he, he hears this threat and he takes off. He loves, leaves Jezreel where he was and he goes to Beersheba, which is in Judah. Now, remember, Elijah lives in the northern kingdom and Judah is the southern kingdom. So it's about a 120 mile trip that he makes to run away. How could Elijah run like this? It was fear. Now you see those words in verse 3, there was afraid. Those words literally means he saw fear. He saw fear. Here's a man, even though Ahab was out looking for him as the trouble of Israel and wanted to kill him, what did he do? He went and he showed himself to Ahab. He didn't run. He went to him and he says, yes, I'm the trouble of Israel. I'm here. He killed the 850 prophets of Baal. And he prayed earnestly on a cloudless day that it would rain, and it rained. How could he run? Well, you would think he would be so bold that he would go and stand up in front of Jezebel and say, what are you going to do? But he runs. He was fearful. He saw fear. James Merritt says this. He says, Satan is the sinister minister of fear and discouragement. How about you when discouragement comes, do you get fearful? And then you run? You know, fear and anxiety are natural human feelings. You know, we, we all feel it from time to time, but what God does, you know, he tells us what to do with our anxiety. He tells us in Isaiah 41.10, he says, do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And then he tells us in Philippians 4, 6, he says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and, and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the rest of it, the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. But just in case that doesn't happen and we're still anxious, he tells us in 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. And we would all do well to remember that because discouragement will come when we have fear. Notice letter B though, discouragement is caused by forgetfulness. What kind of forgetfulness am I speaking of? I'm speaking of forgetting what God has already done. Discouragement comes when we forget what God did yesterday. Why? Because we're looking at today's circumstances. Did you get that? Discouragement comes when we forget what God did yesterday because we're looking at today's circumstances. And with Elijah, he was focused on the wrong J. Think about it. Yesterday, he was focused on Jehovah. The only person he could see was Jehovah. Today, he's focused on Jezebel. His perspective had changed. He forgot what Jehovah did, and it was ridiculous that he feels that way. Now, think your way through this for with me. It's, 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 it's irrational that he's thinking this way. Jezebel is making a threat based on a god or gods that Elijah, the day before, had just proved didn't exist. She's calling on these gods who couldn't even send fire down, and he proves they didn't exist. It makes no sense. He just proved on Mount Carmel that Baal didn't exist. But now he's scared at her threat, and he's running away. Why? Because he has temporary amnesia. That is how discouragement comes. That's how it happens with us too. We forget what God did yesterday to take care of us. And we forget what God did yesterday that the same thing that he did yesterday, he can do today. He's the same God, the same power that he had yesterday. That's the same power he can display today. Elijah was discouraged because he left God, apparently, on top of Mount Carmel. 
spiritual victory. He left him there. He didn't bring God with him down to Jezreel, where he is today. And we need to remember that when we're discouraged, that we need to bring the God of yesterday with us into our circumstances of today. Notice letter C, discouragement is caused by loneliness. Look at what he does again in in verse 3. And he was afraid and arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. You see, he leaves his servant in Beersheba, and he goes off by himself into the wilderness. And it's not bad enough that he's 120 miles away from where Jezebel is, but he goes another 15 miles into the desert um, to be by himself. We see in the rest of verse 4, and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die. And said, it is enough now, O Lord, take my life, for I am not better than my fathers. Discouragement leads to loneliness. Oftentimes, discouraged people avoid relationships. If you are here this morning and you're facing discouragement, perhaps there's loneliness inside. Why? Because discouragement and loneliness are twins. And here's Elijah, he's, he's experiencing both. You know, it would, it would have been better for him to have someone support him. But he goes away alone, which is never good. Last Sunday afternoon when I received some bad news, I could hard, barely eat lunch. My disposition changed. I was so discouraged. But I had options. I could sit and sulk, and I could just shut out Monica and Cam for the rest of the afternoon, or I could do something else. So I said, Monica, let's go for a walk. And we, we did the longest walk of the summer. Um, I know Monica and Elizabeth walks throughout the week, and I try to beat them um, in the amount of miles. Um, so we did the longest walk of the summer. We did five miles. If you know Worcester, we did the whole of Indian Lake, starting at our house and down and around. It was five miles and a little bit more. Um, and I felt better. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 and 10 says, Two are better than one because they have a good return for their labor. For if one of them falls, the one will lift them up, up his companion. But woe to the one who falls when there is not another to lift him up. Another person, doesn't have to be a spouse, helps give the perspective. They help wise us up. You see, had Elijah just prayed, God would have sent someone alongside him, or he would have, or his servant who travels with him could have been that person to strengthen him, to encourage him. That's what encourage means. It means, we, we saw the word courage, acting despite fear. Um, discourage is, is without courage. Encourage means to, to put courage in, right? That's what that, that words mean. And, and that is how the Spirit works even today. Sometimes you never know when someone else might come alongside you, but if you isolate yourself, God can't do that, and your discouragement gets worse. So if you're going through, going to beat discouragement, you can't beat it without looking to God. And many times God will, we use somebody else, perhaps from this body, to come alongside to encourage you. But notice the progression here. Um, similar to loneliness, letter D, discouragement is caused by isolation. He isolates himself and he, he gets into self-pity. Verse 4, and he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a juniper tree and he requested for himself that he might die and said, it is enough, Lord. Lord, take my life for I am not better than my father's. You see, it's usually when we isolate ourselves that, from other people that we have time to think about how bad our circumstances are. And when we start to feel sorry for ourselves. Elijah here, he felt done. He felt like nobody and he wanted to die. He said, Lord, take my life. Now that word life there is a word that means soul. So he's basically saying, Lord, take me to heaven now. Have there been times where you said the rapture could happen right now and I'd be happy? 
It's the same thing he's saying. He's saying, Lord, take me to heaven. I'm done with this world. And so if he, it's not just about dying. It's like he wants to go be with the Lord and to escape that stuff. If it was about dying, he would have just showed himself to, to Jezebel, and she could have taken care of that all alone. But this is what self-pity does. It makes us say things that we don't even mean. So it says in verse 5, he lay down and slept under a juniper tree. Discouragement also leaves us exhausted. All you want to do to sleep is sleep. There's no initiative. There's no push. There's no thrush. There's no initiative to do anything. And that's what happens to him here. Now, you might be thinking, this could never happen to me. But the Bible teaches us that after a high point, we are more vulnerable for a spiritual attack. Victory makes us vulnerable. Remember that. Satan sees that we're flying high and he wants to knock us back down. That's why we need to be aware. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. Fall from what? Fall from the point where he's most vulnerable. Remember this quote. An unguarded strength can potentially be a double weakness. Let me say it again. An unguarded strength can potentially be a double weakness. When you have strength in an area and you forget that it came from the Lord, watch out because the fiery darts are coming. So those are the causes of discouragement. But what are we supposed to do about it? Notice secondly, the cures of discouragement. And there are a couple things that I want us to notice. Notice firstly, discouragement is cured physically, letter A. And when I talk about physically here, I'm talking about getting nourishment and rest. Now watch how God ministers to Elijah here. Look at verse 5. He lay down and slept under a juniper tree, and behold, there was an angel touching him, and he said to him, Arise, eat. This is ministry here in the physical realm. God sends an angel to prepare food for him. Look at verse 6. Then he looked, and behold, there was at his head a bread cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. God wakes him up, and he gives him some angel food cake here and some water. And he eats them, and then he goes back to sleep. Verse 7, the angel of the Lord came again a second time and touched him and said, Arise, eat, because the journey is too great for you. Sometimes the best thing we can do to solve a problem is to get a good meal and a good night's rest. Amen. You want to be spiritual? Sometimes the most spiritual thing that we could do is go to sleep and get some rest. Vince Lombardi says this, he says, fatigue makes cowards of us all. Fatigue makes cowards of us all. Now cowards are people who lack courage. We get discouraged when we get tired. It breeds it. It's a pattern to stay up you know, you know, late sometimes. And if our pattern is to stay up late on Saturday night, it's going to affect us. Some people at times come to church and 10 minutes into the sermon, they start nodding off. By the way, I do notice, um, you know, the big yawns and nodding. I notice it. You know, I get it. Go to bed early. Get a good night's sleep uh, on Saturday. Get here early on Sunday morning because the physical affects the spiritual. We're not compartmentalized. Sometimes men might think that we're compartmentalized, but we're not. Nobody's compartmentalized. There's a connection between the physical and the spiritual. So God gives him rest. He gives him food. But notice also letter B, discouragement is cured by realizing Realizing what? That God is always there. Look at verse 8. So he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, 
the mountain of God. Now he wanders around for 40 days and 40 nights and he ends up at Mount Horeb. Horeb is also now known as Mount Sinai. Remember, that was where the covenant was originally established. There will be an important, there's an important connection here. But it's called the mountain of God here in verse 8. Look at verse 9. Then he came there to a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And he said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Now he's still running here. He's not gotten it yet. So he's there in the cave. And, and even though God sends him to Oreb and and um, he's hiding in the cave. But did you see God's grace here in verse 9? The word of the Lord came to him. God still doesn't abandon him. God's still there. Remember, that's the point. Realizing that God is there. God's there and he says, What are you doing here, Elijah? God didn't rebuke him. He gently says to Elijah, What are you doing here? He knows what he's doing. <laughs> God knows what he's doing, but God wants to get his attention. It's like that same question. I was thinking about this morning, I, I, just this morning, um, the same question God asked Adam. Do you remember? Um, they had eaten of the fruit. God comes down to have fellowship. And God says, where are you, Adam? <laughs> God knew where he was. But God wanted Adam to, to kind of own up to it. But look at, what, look at Elijah's answer in verse 10. He says, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts. For the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your, your altars, and killed your prophets with the, with the sword. And I alone am left, and, and they seek my life to take it away. He's saying, I've worked hard for you. But the people... The people that you've given to me, they haven't listened to me. They've killed your prophets. They've broken your covenants. Can't you picture him? You know, I was thinking about this again this morning, and Sunday mornings is a time where I, 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 I spend a couple hours going over the sermon again and, and getting ready. But I was thinking about, like, a, you think about a little kid, right? They, they fall or... And, and heard something, and they're 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 crying and hyperventilating, and they're <laughs> and they can't catch their breath, and you know that's how I pictured Elijah kind of going, you know, I'm zealous for you, <laughs> and they killed their prophet, and he's just hyperventilating, and God's just there listening to him patiently. That's how I picture it. Why is he discouraged? Because the people, when you really look at what he's saying, is the people have rejected God. Not because they haven't listened to him. They, they're rejecting God. And he, he feels that he is alone in this. Pastors and preachers can relate to that all the time. And so he feels like he's alone. But little does he know. If you look down in verse 18, he doesn't know this. But there are 7,000 people that are doing the same thing he's doing. They haven't bowed their knee to Baal either. And if he had known that, and if he had thought about that, well, he learned later, God told him, that would encourage him. Those people are in the same position that he is in. We're never alone. It's never all about us, as Monica always tells me. It's not just about you. Little did I think, right? If we choose to disobey God and quit serving him, he could send others take our place. And then what happens? We miss out on the blessings he had for us. But we should know we're never alone. So we see in verse 11, so he said, go forth and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And so God sends him and says, go to Oreb. That's where I had sent you. Remember, he had Moses do the same thing. And in verse 11, he says, And behold, the Lord was passing by, and a great and strong wind was, was rending the mountains and breaking in pieces the rocks before the Lord, but the Lord was not in the wind. Here's a spectacular event that's occurring, but God was not in the wind, it says here. This reminds me sometimes that we want to see God in the spectacular. Spectacular. 
we say to God, show yourself. And when we say that, we're expecting the spectacular things to take place. The winds and breaking the rocks. Isn't that what a lot of ministries out there are all about? It's about the miraculous and the spectacular. But it says here, the Lord was not in the wind. Which tells me that a lot of the times that we think that God is in our decisions, we're blaming him for something that we're doing. He's not in it. He's not in those actions or decisions. Then we see at the end of verse 11, and after the wind and earthquake, and the Lord was not in the earthquake. He wasn't in the earthquake either. Now another spectacular thing. Look at verse 12. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. Elijah, surely after the wind and the earthquake, he's, he's saying, this has got to be God now in the fire. Remember, he appeared in fire before, just, just a couple days before that. But it wasn't. Verse 12, and after the fire, a sound of a gentle blowing. He wasn't in the other things, but guess what? He was in the gentle breeze. Elijah was looking for the spectacular, but it was in the quiet that God chose to come. Verse 13 tells us, when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave, and behold, a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He wanted to teach Elijah a lesson here. And just right now, this is making me think of the lesson that God taught Peter. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Tend to my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Feed my sheep. He brings him back and he says, he brings him through this experience when he's listening. He says, what are you doing here, Elijah? Peter, do you love me? And go feed my sheep. It's not about, see that passage is not about, with Peter, it's not about the word love, whether he was agape or phileo. That's not what it's about. It's about feeding the sheep. Peter learned more about being a shepherd and about sheep from that moment. And he passes that on to us. God's teaching Elijah this lesson here. He's not always going to speak in the spectacular, but it's also in the quiet moments. Now think back through Elijah's experiences for just a moment. He declared boldly that it would stop rain. And God said, Elijah, on your word, right? That's a lot of authority that God gave to him. Elijah, on your word, you say it and it's going to happen. Elijah said it's going to stop raining. He called it. That's why he was called a troubler of Israel. Then he prayed and fire came down and, and burned the sacrifice. The disciples wanted to, they said, Jesus, did you want us to call fire down? They were thinking back to what Elijah did and they're saying, well, let's just call fire down. But then Elijah, he prayed again and it poured rain. All dramatic things, right? All dramatic but God wanted to show him that even though your experience has been in the dramatic so far, I want you to see that I don't always speak that way. How does that relate to us? Sometimes we look for God only in the spectacular. We look at what else is going on out there, or even, even in, 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 in our lives as Christians, we might say, look at that person who's a Christian. Look at all the great things God's doing in their life because of spectacular things. Or we might look at these large churches and we say, look at what God's doing because, and I'm not making the case that all large churches are not doing God's will. I'm just saying we might say, look at them. God's doing all these remarkable things and we forget that it's not always about that. A lot of the times, it's in that still, quiet voice. On that Sunday, when things don't always go the way we expect, 
when we don't have the, the morning worship experience that we expected. It's wonderful, we know, when God speaks in the spectacular, um, but that's not our daily experience. God speaks to us in the daily grind. And if we would quiet ourselves enough, we can hear him and we can allow him to encourage us in our discouragement. There's a still, quiet voice this morning. What's it saying to you? It could be a number of things. Is it, is it the voice calling you to salvation? Say, be saved. Is, is, is that voice calling you to, to some greater level in your relationship with Christ? I read a true account of two engineers, two train engineers on a north-south railroad, and they were on a train going through Lafayette, Indiana. This happened on May 12, 1998. You can look it up. Now, as they were running, it was a 92-car train, so it was pretty long. And as they were running this train through Lafayette, Indiana, the train engineers, Robert Moore and Rodney Lindley, were looking 150 yards down the track. And they saw what looked like a yellow puppy as they looked down. Rodney pulled a whistle and then the horn, and what popped up sent them into shock. It wasn't a yellow puppy, but it was the yellow hair of a 19-month-old toddler. She was sitting on the tracks and looking at the train. Robert jumped out the door and he walked down the catwalk on the side of the, the locomotive and, and he got out there as close as he could to the front of the train with the little girl still just sitting there and, and they could see, they're recounting this later and her mother was in the front in the yard doing gardening and she had thought that her little girl Emily was inside playing but apparently the girl had snuck out the door and had um, climbed onto the railroad tracks. So the train is still coming closer and closer to her, and Rodney's yanking, he's in the, the thing, and he's yanking on the brakes furiously. Now the train slowed down to about 10 miles an hour, but as Rodney recalls later on, he says it still felt as if we were, we were just eating up the rail, going faster and faster. And as that happened, she just sat there watching us for what seemed like an eternity. Now, Robert is out on the front of the train with one foot on the step of the, of the side of the train, and he's clutching the guardrail with one hand, and he's going to try and grab her as they're going for it, because the train hasn't stopped yet. But suddenly she moved to the rail, and, and he knew with her in that position he wouldn't be able to grab her. So when he got there, he swung his foot at the child and kicked her out of the way, tumbling her down a rocky embankment. Now, Emily, the little girl, was unharmed except for a chipped tooth and a cut on her forehead that required 20 stitches. Now, why did I tell you that account? Only to ask you this question. What would be better? Just to be kicked down the hill, have a chipped tooth, and require stitches, or have a 6,200-ton train hit you head on? Some of you may say, neither. <laughs> but here's the point. When we go through difficult days, and we face discouragement, look at it this way that God is doing, he's about to do something in our lives because he loves us. And what feels like that kick that we may sometimes get from time to time resulting from discouragement may lead to something that we are not even aware of. Elijah was discouraged, and even though he felt that God has deserted him and kicked him to the curb, and that he was alone, but God encouraged him. 
and wanted him to know that he needed to listen to him in a still, small voice. And we have to remember that God loves us even when we're bouncing down the hill. And we have to remember that even as we're bouncing down the hill and we feel like things are out of control, we should still pray earnestly. And remember, God is in control. Yes, we might have a chipped tooth and 20 stitches, but even in that, we have to be thankful for God's protection and for his encouragement. Do you need that this morning? I know I, know I do. For, for you, it may not be today, but you may need it tomorrow. And when that happens, we need to remember that God is the cure for all discouragement. So after being discouraged this week, God didn't wait long to cure that in discouragement. First, that long walk did a lot to help, and I had a good night's sleep. And then I got an email with the subject line on Tuesday. The subject line was, interested in your church. And the email says, hello, my name is blank. I'm moving to your area soon. Over the past few months, as I've been considering moving, I've been looking to get closer to God. I grew up in a religious family, but it's been a long time since I've been to church. This past year has made me reconsider my life. I'm making a fresh start, and I wonder if your church might be a good home for me. With my new beginning, I'm looking to attend a church where I will be welcomed sincerely. And this person signed their name. Folks, there's still work to do. People to get saved. People to minister to. Let's not be discouraged at something that happened yesterday. Let us be encouraged at what God will do tomorrow. Let's not wallow in self-pity, but let's get to work. Let's pray. God, thank you for this word. And I pray, Lord God, that you would seal it to our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.